The following is a Shaw TV public affairs presentation. When it comes to opposition critic roles, there's nothing better right now than to be finance critic or environment critic. There are so many targets for Tracy Reddy's and Peter Millibar, it is not funny, and there's no shortage of them coming in the years ahead. Good evening and welcome to Voice of BC. I'm Keith Balder, your host tonight for a vacationing Vaughn Palmer. He'll be back next week. Glad to be here. We've got, we've got two new faces on the show and two relatively new faces in the BC political scene. Their first time MLAs from the BC Liberal Caucus. Tracy Reddy's from Surrey White Rock. Welcome. Thanks, Keith. Also the finance critic and BC Hydro critic as well. Yes. And Peter Millibar from Kamloops North Thompson. Thanks for having me. The environment critic and climate change critic as well. So That's welcome right. to you both. Hope you're going to be on the show lots more than just, just tonight. But uh, first of all, How's it been uh, being an MLA? I mean, it's, you're still relatively new in the job. There's all sorts of new experiences. Have you found your way around the legislature so far in terms of knowing where Yeah, actually, one of my first concerns was uh, not getting lost in the legislature, so I am literally trying to find my way around it. But no, it's, it's actually been a really good experience. I, uh, it's been different to what I anticipated. Um, but, you know, all in all, I've actually, as I've said to, to many of my friends and uh, colleagues uh, from before that have asked me how it's going, I said, you know, it's been a really great experience. What about the, the session? We're going to talk more about being an MLA in a moment, but uh, the session's going to begin again next week. You've had a three-week break. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, first of all, how would you characterize what's been happening in the session so far? Um, you know, I think we're starting to find our feet as an opposition. I think I think the first session we did uh, quite well as well, but uh, obviously going through a leadership race at that time, it was uh, a little bit more challenging to uh, to really bring that front forward. And I think uh, um, after 16 years in government, it probably took a little bit of a transition time as well for for all sides. Right? We saw the the government standing up, and they would call people minister on the other side, mm -hmm. on our side, and yes. and that. So I think that first few weeks in the fall uh, kind of flatten that out and now uh, with the, with Andrew and as our leader and and that, that clear direction forward I think we've really been uh, been able to hold the uh, government to account and I think we'll come back even stronger here starting next week. What do you expect next week Tracy in terms of issues that might dominate? Well I think there's going to continue to be a lot of uh, discussion around the taxation uh, measures that the uh, government has brought in uh, with you know apparently with not too much uh, analysis or mm -hmm. thought. Uh, we've already seen changes on the speculation tax. I think uh, the employer's health tax is a, is a very big issue, certainly for the people that have been contacting me. So I, I expect a lot of uh, these issues will continue to uh, be ones that we're, we'll be focusing on. Now, as is usually the case on the show, we're going to hear from a number of our regular uh, contributors tonight. And first off, leading off is uh, regular contributor Bruce Halzer with a question back to the, the experience of being new MLAs. You were the CEO of a big financial institution for five years before becoming an MLA. I'm sure you expected the job of MLA to be different than what you were used to. Perhaps you expected to be in government and not be in opposition. I wonder if you could tell viewers what you expected things to be like as an MLA and what has been the biggest surprise um, for you as an opposition MLA. So an interesting point Bruce makes, I think uh, everybody's running to win and hoping they form government, but I think it's fair to say there was more confidence on the Liberal side that they were going to remain in government than there was on the NDP side. But you wake up, well, a few days later after the election to discover you're on the opposition side. So what kind of transition was that? Well, for me, uh, to be honest, uh, I mean, I did actually consider that one of the options um, might be that we, we did, we'd be in opposition. So I, I had actually already thought about that uh, before I made the decision to run. Um, uh, you know, obviously we would have preferred to have been uh, in government, but, you know, actually, as I think about it now, uh, you know, as somebody who's very new to politics, has never had any uh, experience in politics, uh, being on the an opposition MLA is actually not a bad way to start. Uh, and uh, I've found it very interesting. I really like learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what's been surprising to me is that I'm learning so much. And uh, and I've also, I think, been able to use some of my skills uh, in government, which is my, my biggest concern uh, all the way in terms of joining up. And Peter Milbar, you were in government. You were the mayor of Kamloops. Yeah. Uh, so you've had experience on that side. What, how have you found the transition over to the opposition side? Um, you know, it's about what I thought it would be. I, I had to, the biggest thing I had to reconcile coming out of, of being a mayor was um, 
uh, being comfortable enough in the knowledge as a mayor it's a very public process when you, you try to guide or direct a discussion or, or have your say or or have input and, and knowing that uh, whether you're in government or you're in opposition that that happens pretty much in caucus meetings which are closed meetings and and you know would I be comfortable going in where you could uh, have a say and sometimes it's listened to sometimes it's not or parts of and, and know that you're still doing uh, good by your community and, and moving projects forward or advocating for people so that was probably the biggest thing I had to reconcile coming from the municipal world mm -hmm. to this um, you know it's been what I thought it would be uh, in terms of that I, I was fortunate I, I was a mayor for nine years so I, I worked with a lot even of the NDP in opposition when they were in opposition um, as chair of our regional district we had uh, NDP MLAs and so um, you know I worked obviously a lot with the government and a lot of the staff are the same uh, behind the scenes as well that I would have worked with on different projects so that was a little seamless I was in this weird mm -hmm. kind of not a not an incumbent MLA but but kind of knew the lay of the land a bit more politically that way um, but yeah I think it's uh, you know the the move forward I think has been good and and it's it's just uh, it's it's really hard to quantify the differences it's it's very nuanced but it's it is very rewarding still from my vantage point and my colleagues vantage point we look down we sit above you of course in question period but also just the general tenor of the house it seems that the new MLAs uh, who had nothing to compare with seem to have a, an easier transition into becoming an opposition mm. member than some of the your, some of your longtime uh, colleagues like Mike DeYoung and Rich Coleman who basically ran the show for so long and now uh, opposition is pretty powerless. Yeah. Well, I think, again, it's probably been, I think you're absolutely right, a lot easier, certainly for, for me because I didn't know any different. Uh, so, um, but I, I think it would definitely be a, a big change for some of the people who've been ministers for, for, for many mm -hmm. years. And uh, also, Peter, is in terms, again, back to your experiences uh, as a mayor, um, it seems like someone like you would have an easier time shifting into just the whole, no, the whole atmosphere of being in an elected office. Well, I mean, the question period atmosphere, especially in that fall session, was a little bit different than uh, around our council tables, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, but um, no, I mean, in terms of standing up and say doing a half hour speech uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, a debate, uh, those types of things, very, very similar to what I would have been used to doing. So that part of it, I think I was able to transition a little easier. But, you know, I think we've seen that uh, with some of our, our colleagues where, especially the ones that were in the leadership race, if they mm -hmm. went from being a cabinet minister to in the leadership race, they were full on busy the whole time. Yeah. I think now we're seeing them hitting the same spot that those previous ministers in the fall were at. Um, and so I think that's also giving us more strength as an opposition that everyone's fully, uh, um, you know, on the same page and moving forward. And, and uh, you know, it's an adjustment, but I, I honestly haven't seen any, um, you know, ego or anything like yeah. that in play. They're, they're all being, um, mm -hmm. you know, a team and, and they're helping out where they can. Well, you mentioned question period. And funnily enough, we have the next question on that from my colleague Rob Shaw, the Vancouver Sun. Your party has a new leader of the opposition. Can you tell us a bit about the new strategy for question period and the approach that uh, he and others have taken in the House? New leader, of course, being Andrew Wilkinson. And we have noticed a big change. I'm sure you have as well from the fall, where both sides were sort of a little disorganized and not really focused, trying to figure out their new, new uh, roles. But now there seems to be a much more strategic approach from your side, much more focused. And new faces such as yours sort of merging to the fore. And there also seems to be a little less um, loudness in the chamber. Everybody seems to be a little more um, on, the, on their behavior. Is that, that your take? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, Andrew has brought a discipline and focus to uh, question period. And I think, you know, that's important because we, what we're trying to do is get answers out of the government. And uh, the more we can uh, spend our time asking them questions uh, rather than, you know, banging tables, yeah. et cetera, uh, the more, um, you know, we can see where, where, they're, where they're coming from, where they're going. And uh, I think that's helpful to uh, everybody, frankly. And you seem to have a more focused um, attack in terms of the issues you're, you're looking at. You know, I, I think in the fall it was sort of, everybody was all over the map all the time. It wasn't a central theme, mm -hmm. but you seem to have hit upon the, sort of those two taxes you mentioned earlier seem to be the dominant issues in question period. Well, absolutely. And I think what you saw in the fall was you saw, again, you had a leadership race unfolding. Um, you had everyone um, trying to figure out where their place in a, in a new role would be. Um, you, you had a, 
a budget update, but not a new budget by the government. So it was uh, a lot of a lot of what was in that budget update was still BC Liberal numbers. Right. Um, so you know, obviously, it makes it a little harder to attack them on something that was your own uh, initiative or, or a budget item. So uh, now that we're seeing their own budget and and it's a rich, uh, target rich environment with uh, all the holes in that budget uh, to ask questions around. It. And as Tracy said, we're really trying to make sure that the public and, and the media um, can hear very clearly what the question is and, and we feel that they deserve to have a very clear answer from the government and so far sadly that's been uh, very lacking. What about, yeah. the, what about the whole notion of question period? I mean there has been criticism uh, I think since certainly last fall when over the, the tenor and the lack of decorum in the house. Mm -hmm. my, my response to a lot of people is look it's an adversarial chamber. Um, it's better than uh, shooting guns at people. It's better to yell at each other but I guess yeah. there's a limit that, where people can take but as newcomers in question period. What, I mean, what do you take from it? Well, for me, I think it's much better if we come across as uh, professional and focused and, and strategic in our questioning. I, I think, uh, you know, as Peter said, it's it's about uh, holding the government accountable. And uh, I think that there's there are different ways to do this. Uh, I'm much more comfortable with how we're doing it now than, than we were before. Um, uh, I've always sort of thought question period was, and I think a lot of the public kind of wonders about the whole uh, validity of it as a as a government process. I think um, what we're trying to do is again uh, hold the government accountable, uh, ask them the uh, questions that we want answers from on behalf of British Columbians, mm -hmm. and uh, and go from there. Do you ever look up at the school children looking down at yeah. your grade fours, <laughs> horrified? What's going on? Well, there? I, I mean, I, I think you know there there was even in that fall session. I, I know the Greens admonished us the one day that the school children were there, but I'd point out three minutes earlier they were screaming yeah. and yelling with the best the of loudest the kids. Loudest heckler's were. Andrew Weaver. Yeah. yeah, and so you know, I, I and I've said to school groups that I've met with, you know, you have to almost look at it. To, you almost look at it as a, a Canadian version of Downton Abbey. We always have the, the, <laughs> the rolling start to the, the day in the ledge and then it ends with the credits and, and in the middle and for that half hour, it's theater. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but it's serious theater at the same time. And that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're not trying to um, uh, minimize the importance of the questions. We're trying to highlight how important these questions are. When we're asking questions about people worried about their livelihoods of, of their small business, of, say a health tax, um, you know, when, when we're getting chuckles back from the other side or when we're getting a total non-answer, mm -hmm. um, that's not a non-answer to me personally. That's a non-answer to the, the employer and the employees of that company uh, who want to know what their future is. And that's what we're trying to get to. And hopefully in these next uh, three weeks coming up, uh, the government will take it a little more uh, to heart Seriously. and actually start answering the question. So there's a lot of new faces in the BC Legislature Chamber since the uh, May 2017 election on both sides. Um, the question along just about what parties need to do in terms of age and such is Christine Winter from the BC Green Party. Do you think that the BC Liberal Party needs to change more in order to keep up with younger voters? And how do you balance that with the fact that your new leader is a Clark era cabinet minister? And speaking of Mr. Wilkinson, how do you feel about the fact that he was the fifth choice of six candidates in the first round of the BC Liberal leadership race? Christine actually got three questions in there, I think. <laughs> but anyways, uh, what about her point about get, attracting uh, young voters? I think that's a challenge to both parties. And the, the NDP seemed to get, well, they are younger than the BC Liberal caucus. They got t nine people in the age of 40. Uh, does, is, is it incumbent upon political parties now to start appealing to millennials and not be obsessed necessarily with baby boomer um, pol the policies that affect baby boomers, but start to look at wooing and getting young people more involved? Yeah, I mean, I think absolutely uh, that we have to look at the, the millennials. Um, uh, you know, that's a, a group that we perhaps haven't um, certainly over-indexed in uh, as far as attracting them as a, as a, voting, a voter. Um, but I think we recognize that now and, um, and, and you know a lot of the issues that Millennials are facing uh, other uh, portions of the population are facing as well affordability uh, things like that so it's not necessarily that the issues are just uh, are with one uh, you know population mm -hmm. segment so um, we do have to uh, broaden our appeal um, I think that's certainly a lesson that we learned in this uh, last election and, and Millennials are increasingly active in the political so we, we, we need to think about that. What, Peter, what about uh, getting more of them involved in politics, in fact becoming candidates, rather than just uh, giving the senior person in the, in the 
constituency, well, you've been here the longest, you get to be the candidate, but say, no, we need some younger blood, basically, in the caucus and in the party. Yeah, and, and I think we saw that last time. Uh, we had uh, several younger yes, candidates we run. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't successful, or they ran in NDP stronghold or, mm -hmm. or very, uh, very strongly held writings. And so, um, you know, it wasn't for lack of effort or trying, but, um, you know, the NDP obviously had a little more success with some of their, their younger candidates. Um, that doesn't necessarily translate that they had the younger voter out. It just mm -hmm. means that uh, they had a younger candidate running that was successful. And I think you always have to be mindful of that. Um, I do think you can balance both out. You need to be uh, mindful that we do have an aging demographic that comes with all of the health care and housing challenges they're going to be facing as they move through uh, you know, older age. And, and at the same time, we do have to be lifting up uh, the millennial generation and those behind. I have, I have three kids that are 19 to 24, so I'm, I'm very much living that every day in terms of uh, where their worries and, and uh, concerns are moving forward for their life. But I also have a, a mother that's a, a senior citizen. So, um, you know, you, in your, everyone's own life, uh, a great many of us mm -hmm. deal with that on a daily basis. So political parties really can't be any different. You think you should put younger uh, candidates in writings so they can actually win rather than just sort of being sacrificial lambs in Vancouver Kingsway or, or something Well, like I mean, I think uh, we have to put the best candidate in uh, in the riding, and uh, but I, I do think a diverse um, slate of candidates will be important going forward. Very good. Well, uh, one of the outcomes of the of the election, of course, was a very strange electoral map. Uh, the, the governing party, the NDP, is basically a Metro Vancouver, Vancouver Island party, and is largely shut out for the rest of the province. And with a question on that is my colleague, the new colleague at Global, Richard Zussman. Peter, a lot has been made about how the NDP basically has all of its representation in Metro Vancouver and Vancouver Island. As an MLA for Kamloops, do you feel like the rest of the province is being well represented by this government? Interesting enough, John, Premier John Horgan is spending this week outside of Metro Vancouver. He's up in the Okanagan. He's been in Kitimat, uh, Kamloops, your hometown. Yeah. Is that an indication that he realizes he may have a problem here, that he, he doesn't have enough support or representation outside of Metro? Um, well, we flew back down to uh, Vancouver today on the same plane, but... Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure. He, only he can answer. He certainly was non-existent in the election. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in Canada, he never went north of Penticton, I think. No, uh, in, in well, he came to Camelot once in, in the election, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know announcements that we've seen in the interior, they've been predominantly re-announcements, uh, slight top-ups here and there, but uh, more or less the same. Uh, what was previously announced. So hopefully moving forward, it doesn't come at the expense of, of other projects and, and we'll see things move forward. I, I think sometimes that rural-urban divide gets uh, played up. Now coming from Kamloops, I, we would hear that a lot between our North Shore and our South Shore people mm -hmm. uh, feel that there's a divide there even when amalgamation happened in Kamloops. And so, um, you know, I think if you dwell on that as opposed to looking at the strengths that everyone provides to each other, uh, certainly the Lower Mainland does provide support to the interior um, and vice versa. And I think but that's where we really need to be focusing and moving forward. That's certainly where our party is trying to focus and be a, a unifying party out there um, and not uh, say one part of the province has to be left behind at the expense of the other. Um, and so that's that's really what we're focusing on. Now, do both parties have a challenge here though, Tracy? I mean, the Liberals have to find a way to sort of re-enter um, the issues that affect voters in, in particularly suburban uh, Metro Vancouver. Urban, yeah. So you've got work to do on that front. The NDP's got work to do on, on sort of the, the northern front. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's, uh, I think what this election told us is you can't form a majority government unless you get um, mm -hmm. uh, all uh, representation in all regions of, of the province. So uh, I think we've got some work to do. The NDP, I think, uh, have uh, a lot of work to do uh, in the north. And, and of course, a lot of the things that they've been introducing recently, particularly with the speculation tax and, uh, and other measures, has certainly uh, made it, I think, a lot harder for them uh, do you in the north. Do you think they've, they've found a way to resonate with voters outside of Metro by uh, deciding to build, complete the Site C Dam and to say, look, we'll, we'll give tax breaks or, or tax incentives to wool and LNG industry. No, I, I don't think that's going to ultimately uh, tip the scales in their favor. Uh, frankly, I, I, there's a lot of people in uh, the interior that are upset that they basically wasted a billion dollars studying a dam that most people realized we needed to build mm -hmm. while they were still talking about electrifying our our uh, province to, to reduce carbon. Um, you know, Kinder Morgan certainly isn't winning them a lot of fans in the interior and even in the lower mainland there is strong support for the, pro the project. And so, um, you know, I think 
overall uh, what the government needs to to do and i'm not trying to give them political advice uh, um, <laughs> but free. you know i i see i see our our focus being more on making sure that we're reconnecting with the lower mainland not forgetting about the interior recognizing that a strong resource industry based economy in the interior does help the lower mainland and how do we make those connections so that uh, all people that are, are needing that that urban uh um, peace uh, feel like the government's helping them and the people in the interior feel like the, the government's helping them as well. All right well we're going to take a very short break here on Voice of BC. Don't go away. We'll be back with Tracy Reddys and Peter Millibar of the BC Liberal Caucus. I'm in question period almost every day but I'm not getting questions every day and uh, we, uh, when I was in opposition, whether it was uh, under the leadership of Gordon Campbell or Christy Clark, the Premier showed up once a week, maybe twice a week to, to take questions. And, and, and I'm, I'm surprised that they haven't asked me more questions about where we're going, but they've, they've also been testing ministers. And uh, I'm very proud of the work that my colleagues have done to be on top of their files uh, in a short period of time and, and show leadership on a number of issues that matter to people. Wait, stop, don't turn that dial. More's coming up as you're watching Voice of BC on Shaw TV. I'm Andrew Weaver, leader of the BC Green Party. There are more ways to connect with us at Voice of BC. Email us at vobc at shaw.ca. Follow us on Twitter at Voice of BC. Or like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash vobc on Shaw TV. I think it's fair to say that the business community is still coming to terms with just how expensive Carol James's new payroll health tax will be. One company we've talked to in Victoria is expecting to spend $61,000 a year on this tax. And that comes on top of CPP, EI, gas and carbon tax increases. They're headed into major cost cutting mode. This is a company that actually shares profits with its employees and they figure it's going to cost every employee between $1,800 and $4,000 a year. Is that really fair? Welcome back to Voice of BC. I'm Keith Baldry here with Tracy Reddys and Peter Millibar, BC Liberal MLAs. So we're going to talk a little bit about the election now. Um, we talked a little bit about it before the break, but I just want to go back to election night and just a couple of days afterwards. No matter where you, what party you belong to, you must have been fascinated by what was what was happening, the drama and the emotions associated with that. Well, yeah, I, I was. I mean, I, I felt a little sheepish because uh, I had been declared fairly early on in mm -hmm. the evening. I was one of the first few uh, ridings called. And so, you know, I, I saw our numbers climbing and I thought, OK, well, it's unfolding as everyone thought it would. And then you look back a little while later and, and uh, you go, oh, geez, it's tightened up quite a bit. <laughs> right. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it was a, it was a very historic time. I, I think it, again, shows the system does work that we currently have. It shows mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, the people can have a voice, that, that every vote does matter, every vote uh, uh, is counted and, and um, has strength and that, uh, uh, you know, yes, it may have taken a, an extra few weeks to figure out the transition of power, but that's a far cry from the, the uh, European countries where we're seeing, you know, six month or a year mm -hmm. and a half uh, bargaining trying to get a government in place. So I, I think overall it, it showed the strength in our system, not the weakness in our system and, and um, you know, it's, it's uh, I think we're better off for it. Was it exciting as well, Trace? I mean, you were in a fairly safe seat, uh, but yeah. still just the drama unfolding in, in, in your first time MLA and going, what the heck's happening here? Well, I remember coming in and, because uh, I, I wasn't probably as early as Peter, but we we were one of the uh, mm -hmm. earlier writings that uh, were announced. And I remember coming in and as uh, I, I was making my uh, 
speech to the to the group that was gathered, uh, we had the TV behind us and it was showing the uh, the seats uh, going back and mm -hmm. forth. Um, and of course, it was, so it was I think very hard for people to uh, concentrate on what I was saying. They were looking at what was actually happening in terms of the actual seats. And I don't think that we went uh, went home until about two o'clock in the morning. Um, so and then just watching it all unfold from there, it uh, you know we were it was history unfolding when we were a part of it, right? Well, I was on the air till two o'clock in the morning. I think we were on there for seven straight hours. I was watching hours. you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a fascinating night. But uh, there's all sorts of theories of why the election went one way or another. What, what were the issues on the table? Bill Tillman now with uh, one of his theories. Ms. Reddy's former B.C. Liberal Finance Minister, Mike DeYoung, delivered the last B.C. Liberal budget without any substantive increases in a whole bunch of social program spending areas. But he had a huge surplus. You think that was a mistake and could it have changed the actual results of the election if he'd spent more on areas that were seen as needing attention badly. Bill Tillman with a point I've heard from a lot of people that uh, the Liberals played it way too safe uh, before the election when they were sitting on a big surplus and could have spent some of that money, whether it's on social programs or on other programs, to get the attention of voters who were looking for a break in their, in their pocketbook. Do you think, uh, in retrospect, the, the Liberals are being a little too cautious here? Well, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have to go back and remember that in the February budget, the uh, government announced that they were going to cut MSP premiums in half. That was a big amount of, uh, of money. Uh, the additional spending uh, in that budget was about a one and a half billion dollars, if I remember correctly. Uh, you know, I think if, if perhaps there had been better clarity that we were, we were going to have the size of the, uh, the, the budget surplus, um, we could have spent more money. Um, and I guess that's, you know, that's just the way things unfolded. Um, I don't think it's, I mean, I think we can learn some lessons from this, but uh, we can't go back and change history. So uh, well, all we need to do now is go forward and, and think what needs to happen for the next election. Given the number of ridings that tipped in Metro Vancouver, where cost of living is a big issue for, for pretty well everybody who lives around it, pretty well what your income level is. Do you think that there was that disconnect there between your, your former party before you actually became an MLA and the people who live there? Well, you know, I, I think um, obviously we, we lost some seats in the lower mainland, so more work could have been done. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, the NDP, as we saw in the new book, uh, um, rolled the dice with a, a snap decision around a tolling policy uh, to try to one-up our well-thought-out uh, polling policy, uh, tolling policy around $500 cap um, and, and going down to zero and pulling the tolls completely. And, and the reason I bring that up is because they, they rolled the dice on one snap budgeting decision and, and it paid off for them. Um, but we're seeing in this current budget what happens when you start making uh, decisions with budgets on the fly. And so, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to in fairness with, with Mike and, and the previous cabinet to start just trying to throw in little tidbits here, there and everywhere without properly thinking it through all the way around, um, that's not the type of people they are. They want to make sure that they, they really think things through, uh, that it's well thought out that uh, possible implications uh, have been looked at mm -hmm. and and that's how you implement a change in a budget or a program you don't just fling things out and they got lucky with the tolls uh, in terms of that but it we're going to see that come through in terms of that cost in these budgets and now we're seeing it play out with speculation tax with the employer health tax and all those mm -hmm. other on the fly type budgetary decisions so you mentioned the book. The book, of course, is Richard Zussman, my global colleague, and Rob Shaw's book, A Matter of Confidence. And you mentioned tolls. There's a marvelous scene in this book where uh, Bob Dewar, the chief of staff of John Horgan at the time, almost slaps his forehead and says, of course, we're going we're gonna to get rid of the tolls. And with, with consulting anybody, they rolled the dice, as Peter says, and they got rid of the tolls. And, well, the result was Surrey flipped a number of writings over to the NDP side. And with a question on that is our friend Bruce Halzer. Most political commentators look at the switch of seats from BC Liberals to the NDP in Surrey as the big reason why we don't have a BC Liberal government today and we have a NDP Green government. As one of the surviving Surrey MLAs, I wonder what your thoughts are about how the BC Liberal and NDP platforms affected Surrey, um, what could have been done differently, and what you think the prospects are for the BC Liberals in Surrey next time. Surrey, of course, pivotal battleground in this province may determine the outcome or who forms government in this uh, province for elections to come. So, Tracy Reddy's, what was going on in Surrey? Why did 
I tell you, the Liberals certainly seem shocked that they lost writings like Surrey Panorama mm -hmm. and such. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a dynamic at play there that we weren't aware of, or, or the tolls, really the big, the big uh, switch? Well, I think the tolls were a big uh, issue. I think there was also some, uh, you know, simmering uh, uh, unrest with respect to teachers. Uh, I think there was also concern around ride sharing with taxi drivers. So it was, there was a fairly broad, you know, broad group that um, had, I guess, uh, potentially some differences of opinion with how the BC Liberal government was doing things. And, uh, you know, again, hindsight's 2020. Uh, we perhaps should have been on top of those issues a lot, uh, a lot uh, more carefully. Um, I think, though, going forward, I mean, I'm hearing a lot from uh, Surrey people that they don't like um, some of the stuff that the new government's doing, uh, particularly the taxation. So, uh, and, uh, you know, there are promises that the government has not kept. Um, so I... I, th I think it might be a different story next time mm. round, and, and for sure we see Syria as a battleground. And Peter Millivar, I mean, the, I think it's, the book uh, reflects this, this sort of the <clears throat> NDP not really thinking they were going to win. It just seemed that they were just sort of yeah. coming up with ideas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they set the, the expectations bar set pretty high, particularly in Metro Vancouver, for delivering on lower housing, uh, you know, better transit. All these things are supposed to, and more childcare, more, uh, more yeah. all sorts of things that are supposed to happen very quickly. Yeah. Is that your sense as well that it's impossible to live up to? those expectations? Well, and I think that's what we're going to see right now. Everyone's uh, seen money being promised and spent, um, but they haven't seen the bill come in their mail yet. And I think over the next few months, when that starts to happen, that, that starts to uh, be where the rubber hits the road with any government. And when you're seeing, you know, for all the bluster about, say, government advertising, when I keep watching uh, non-stop government advertising talking about a $7 billion housing program and then referencing 114,000 housing units at the same time, it leads one to believe $7 billion is paying for 114,000 units. Yet they've said, it's said about 30,000 units are actually going to deliver on and the 114,000 would be about 28 to 30 billion dollar mm -hmm. project. So I mean, even with their their government advertising, they're they're setting a false expectation and a false narrative out there that's totally contradictory what the premier is standing up and saying. And at a certain point, credibility takes a big hit uh, when they keep sending out these conflicting messages. It's interesting how much government advertising they're actually doing. Although as a member of the media, I can't really talk about that. I mean, there's a bit of a conflict of interest. But you've raised, uh, our guests have raised a number of issues about the budget and with sort of an omnibus question on that is our friend Bill Tillman. Ms. Reddys, when Finance Minister Carol James brought in the BC budget in February, it appeared to be well received even by the business community. But since then there have been a number of kind of surprises or pieces of the budget that didn't seem obvious at the time that have come back to bite the NDP. What do you think is the real problem with the BC budget that could be fixed, and will it be fixed? Interesting observation by Bill Tillman. I remember in the budget lockup with the stakeholders when they merged the media lockup with all the other interest groups, there really wasn't a lot of negativity even in the business side, but Bill's right. As it's progressed, as the, the light is shone on the speculation tax and, and the pennies dropping on this payroll tax, that's two areas that seem, again, they form the guts of question period so far. Yes. Um, is that the most vulnerable area of this budget? I think uh, it is. Um, I think actually, you know, to, to add on to what uh, Peter was saying earlier, um, you know, the government keeps talking about affordability. But if you look in the uh, one of the back tables of the budget, it shows that taxation per capita is rising from $5,600 in uh, 2017 to $7,050 per capita by 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not creating more affordability for British Columbians. That's adding on tax. And uh, I think businesses are, are getting hit from all sides. They've got the employer's health tax. They have mini minimum wages rising, uh, the, um, the carbon tax. Uh, so it's all these things all coming together. And, and I think what is incredible to me as someone who's been in the finance uh, business for a long time is the lack of modeling or uh, real forecasting of what the quantum of these taxes are going to do to the business environment. And I think the businesses are starting to realize it because, uh, and the municipalities, um, uh, the universities, I mean, th these are huge numbers. And they all are gonna trickle down uh, to property owners mm -hmm. or to the cost of goods sold or to potentially job loss or lack of you know, job growth. And that's, that's the way this is gonna go. Peter Milvar, even in a couple of new, De new Democrats, uh, not necessarily members of this government, just old hands have expressed some concern to me that, uh oh, their party is going to be again framed by taxation 
which was a problem in the 90s. They barely won that 96 election by the skin of their teeth after huge tax increases. You think that uh, that may force some changes on that front because of the, historically uh, they're seen as a tax and spend party that they don't last long? Well, I, I think that's why historically across the country they don't last long. Um, and so it's not just uh, exclusive to BC. But, um, you know, when you look right now at, at the sheer level of, of spending increase across the board, and yet the still uh, mind-boggling number of broken promises that still come with even mm -hmm. that increased spending, um, there's going to be a lot of unhappy uh, former supportive uh, uh, groups out there. Um, you know, we talk about Surrey and the Lower Mainland. If you look at, um, you know, the promise that there will never be another portable in Surrey in four years, mm -hmm. um, and then you look at the $2 billion for capital with, with uh, the school budget, and that's supposed to include seismic, that's inc including new builds across the province, that's including uh, renovation money for schools around the province, as well as all the Surrey portables, uh, the numbers don't add up. And so either no one else in the province is getting any work done, and Surrey's getting all the work done, or it's just, it's, it's a false premise. And I think as the longer people uh, see this unfold, they will see that. And, and how do you just remove a speculation tax without having a hit to your number? How do you say you're going to look at, at exemptions for the employee health tax to almost half of the payroll out there uh, without having a billion dollar hole in your numbers. And so again, it comes down to credibility, it comes down to credibility of these are their own platforms too. This isn't even us politicizing. Mm -hmm. This is this is the NDP platform, which I'll remind everyone, through the election, they kept insisting every all of it was fully costed and fully funded from existing BC mm -hmm. Liberal numbers. That was even before the $2.7 billion surplus. So, I mean, the fact they can't even come close to delivery on their promises, their promises, um, in an even bigger funding envelope uh, doesn't bode well for the future. Do you think, is it your expectation you're going to make the payroll tax still the centerpiece of uh, the attack going forward? Well, I think it's going to be one of them. Uh, I mean, I think we're obviously very concerned about, again, the quantum of taxes that are hitting the, uh, the business community. And then when you layer on uh, some of the other things that the NDP have been doing around Kinder Morgan or even what they did with Site C, you know, the investment climate in BC is looking quite quite grim right now. And when I talk to businesses, and we've been talking to quite a few of them over the last uh, three weeks, there is a palpable sense of fear of what's coming down uh, the pipeline. And, and as Peter mentioned, you know, the NDP, they have increased spending by $10 billion in the first 10 months of their office. Uh, and they still are, haven't finished what they said they were going to do. So, uh, you know, this is uh, shaping up to be a tax and spend uh, government for sure. Now you mentioned the word investor. And one of the big investors the Horgan government is looking for is the LNG industry. It had a big announcement uh, a short time ago offering all sorts of tax incentives to uh, wooing LNG Canada to come into BC. And with a question on that, our, my friend and colleague Richard Zussman. The NDP seem well on their way, Tracy, to getting uh, LNG in this province. Were they able to deliver on something that the Liberals, I know you weren't in government, but that the Liberals, when in government, were never able to do? Well, there's, according to certainly a lot of business analysts we read in the paper, uh, LNG Canada seems to be inching towards the final investment decision of actually coming in. I mean, is, is the word ironic to be used here if suddenly John Horgan is the premier at a time when, when the LNG actually comes into, into BC after Christy Clark's, all those efforts from the Clark government? Well, I suspect the decision is going to be made, made primarily on what uh, LNG Canada thinks uh, the LNG market is going to be. And, and certainly we've seen in the, in, that they're in the forecasts that there looks like there's going to be increasing demand. Uh, so I think that's probably what's motivating LNG Canada. The NDP may be getting a bit lucky with timing. Um, and uh, they certainly seem to be ready to give away the farm, which uh, I don't think the previous government thought was the best uh, approach. So uh, we'll see. Um, these are big investment decisions, and, uh, but I think it's driven primarily on what the market looks like. And, you know, for the, the few years after uh, the Christy Clark uh, had uh, uh, promised LNG, the market was pretty weak. So. Peter Miller, do you think that because Christy Clark and the previous government went all in on LNG and was so closely identified with it that it's sort of part of the DNA of the party now, that even if LNG Canada does come in, 
Um, is there some sort of residual payoff to the VC liberals for the, being the ones to actually get it going, even though John Horgan is the premier at the time? Yeah, you know, and again, I, I think that goes to your earlier question about uh, people in the north and the interior. I think they know who has been the champion of these types of projects for a long time and who for uh, political reasons now suddenly come on board and, and mm -hmm. decided to be supportive. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think uh, they run the risk now that their supporters in those regions feel uh, maybe a little disenfranchised and disillusioned uh, by their own government and at the same time our supporters are saying see we knew it was right all along and and so um, you know I think we're going to continue to press to see those types of projects move forward uh, that's where, how we see our economy grow uh, you can't just keep taxing the same person over and over again and layering taxation on and, and think that that's going to solve uh, your spending problems and so um, overall I, I think that's what we need to keep moving but we have already heard from people that um, you know the exemption of the carbon tax for LNG but uh, at the same same time it's increasing for all other industry uh, you know there's other segments out there that are a little concerned around that there's people in their own homes are a little concerned that uh, um, you know they, they're having to pay more to heat their home and, and fill up their tank but uh, LNG won't and so uh, I think those things still need to be looked at but if it's like any other uh, tax policy that's been presented shortly or recently it'll probably get amended 16 times between now and <laughs> next week so all right well we're gonna take our second break here on voice of BC so stay with us still got lots more to talk about with Tracy Reddy's and Peter Millar. Wow. I haven't had one of these things in years. Maybe it's been since 2013. Don't know. But you know, the recent business book, Kinder Morgan, with the NDP doesn't really surprise me all that much. They did it before, right? And... It makes sense with the Greens and so on and so forth. And if you want to talk about surprises, honestly, Sight C, when I think back to it, wasn't much of a surprise either. It was halfway done. It was a tough call. But the real surprise, the real surprise about all this stuff to me right now is the LNG stimulus package that the NDP has done. Are they giving up on the Greens? Do they want an election now? Is this about John Horgan trying to win back some constituencies, the hard hat constituencies, where he came from and they need to win back votes in the interior? Is it Justin Trudeau putting the screws to them after the Kinder Morgan wine in Alberta stuff? You do this, or otherwise we won't give you anything you want from the federal government. Yeah, maybe that makes sense. I think I'll eat this thing, although they do say it's a choking hazard. Hmm, should ask the Minister of Health. I'm Selena Robinson. I'm the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It's Thursday night. You're watching Voice of BC, and so am I. Both of the MLAs on the show tonight uh, come from some accomplishment in their communities and their business lives. Neither have long partisan affiliations or backgrounds. Often MLAs like that become disillusioned during their first term as they adjust to the partisan nature of the legislature and, and party politics in BC. Uh, it's a nature of politics to be with your team, to support your team, but often first time MLAs choose not to have a second term because it's not their style. It'll be interesting to see how these two MLAs develop in their first term. Back on Voice of VC with Tracy Reddys and Peter Middlewar of the VC Liberal Party, two first time MLAs. Bruce Halser, you just heard him there, made an interesting point. I think he's right. Some MLAs do come in here, get disillusioned and leave. But it's been my experience, most of that 
seems to have occurred on the government side because they come in and a backbencher is sort of, there's a real difference between being a cabinet minister running the show and a backbencher, whereas on the opposition side, everybody's equal more or less and mm. you're sort of more freewheeling and got a lot more able to speak your mind. Is that, uh, I mean, I don't think you guys are disillusioned yet. <laughs> but, um, you think that's a, a fair comment? I, I, I guess it, it could be. Uh, I mean, for me, uh, I think um, whether I was in opposition or in government, um, the big issue for me is actually getting things done, uh, getting things done for my riding. Um, you know, I'm uh, in my business life, I'm used to sort of fixing things and solving problems and moving ahead. So I think that's, uh, that's the only area that could cause, could potentially cause me to rethink. But uh, right now I'm really enjoying it and uh, we seem to be able to, Notwithstanding the being on different sides of the house, you know, behind the scenes, we do work together to get some things done, and uh, and that's uh, that's been um, that's been good. Do you find the NDP government um, receptive to private things you bring to their attention in your constituency? Yeah, I, I haven't. Uh, you know, uh, to be fair, I haven't had a big problem with that. Um, you know, we had a housing uh, announcement yesterday in Kamloops that I brought to the minister about three, four weeks ago, and and uh, we saw some action on that, um, and so. Uh, and other ministers, we've had similar types of, of issues. And so, I, you know, I don't know if I'm still kind of, because when I was mayor, I wasn't a party member. I was, um, uh, you know, a mayor. And mm -hmm. I, I always felt that you should be uh, as non-political as possible and, and advocating. And so I didn't have control of the government then to try to advocate for projects. I don't have control of the, 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 the ear of a minister now. So you still have to take that kind of same approach of trying to work across lines. And it goes back to the whole theater piece of, of question period. I think both sides see it for what it is. And I, I see both sides uh, getting together to work for the betterment of their constituents' issues and problems uh, uh, outside of that time frame. And I think that happened when we were in government, and, and I'm seeing it continue to happen now. From my vantage point, again, it, th it seems a little less partisan right now around the legislature. Both sides are sort of settling into their roles and being a little more cooperative with each other. We'll see if that holds for four years. I'm not necessarily confident that's the case. <laughs> We're going to hear from Bruce Halzer again about an issue that's basically dominating the headlines. Uh, that's the proposed Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion. The night we're taping this show, there's a big protest in Vancouver uh, to greet uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, who's having a fundraising dinner there, uh, vowing again on his latest visit to BC in the tar sands that he's going to get that pipeline built. Here's Bruce Halzer with another take on the consequences of not building a pipeline. Kamloops probably has more rail per capita than any other place in BC. Both the big national lines come through there. Um, Kamloops is also on the route of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. If pipelines don't happen, there's lots of expectation that there will be more uh, bitumen, more dangerous goods carried by rail. Is that a factor in the debate in Kamloops about these sorts of things at all? Bruce Halls are raising a, <laughs> a, a, an argument and a point that is sort of lost in the din of the protests and on either side of this issue. So Peter Millibar, what's how's it playing in Kamloops? It, that's been talked about since day one of the proposal. I mean, the, the rail line, uh, CN, runs uh, the same route as uh, the Kinder Morgan pipeline. It's going across the same streams next to the same rivers. Uh, the highway system, uh, Highway 5, runs on the exact same route as well. Um, and then we have, of course, the CP and the Trans-Canada Highway coming through Kamloops as well. So we see it all. Uh, we see lots of dangerous goods on a daily basis coming through, uh, as any rail community would. Um, and, and there's other economic uh, realities with the rail lines. It's not just uh, that pure safety of what happens if a car dumps into the river. Um, there's also, you know, we're, we're unnecessarily clogging up a rail line mm -hmm. with a product that can be shipped by pipe, unlike wheat, unlike uh, two by fours, unlike other products and commodities that we need to get to market across Canada or to ports uh, that we need that rail access for. Um, we also have a Rocky Mountain Rail Tour, which is huge to our local economy on the tourism side, but it's huge to the Lower Mainland's economy and Squamish and, and everywhere. And so, you know, to, to unnecessarily clog either a highway system or a, a rail system with a product, which is the only one that's being transported that could be uh, economically, and the economics work for it to be transported by uh, pipe, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. And Tracy, in Metro Vancouver, I think there's probably more opposition to the pipeline than there is outside of Metro Vancouver. But what about the argument? Rachel Notley raised this argument, the Premier of Alberta, the other day, that if you suddenly uh, required rail cars to ship bitumen or crude oil, uh, the price of grain would go up because there's just much less grain getting to market as, as a result. There's only so many rail cars out there and so many you know miles of track. Is that is that an argument? I, again, you don't hear that often. It's mostly about potential marine spills and, and such. 
Well, I, again, you know, we, we, we live in a very complex uh, economy, right? And uh, I mean, I think there, there's already uh, indication out there that, that grain, they're having trouble getting it to market because um, oil uh, and other products are, are, are uh, taking up a lot of the, uh, the, the capacity. Um, so I, I actually think that uh, Premier Notley does have a point. And, um, you know, and I think everybody obviously wants to make sure that things are, are safe. I live in a community where we have uh, dangerous goods going through our uh, highly dense uh, population. You've got that rickety area. rail line down We've there. got the BNSF uh, rail line going through there with uh, oil. Mm -hmm. uh, androgynous ammonia. Uh, in fact, this is something that I've been actually talking to the Premier about because, uh, you know, we're very concerned about the safety issues on that front. So, I mean, I can, I appreciate this and I think everybody wants to make sure that things are safe, but we also have to look at it in terms of what are the unintended consequences of actions that we take. And I, I think pipelines have, have been demonstrated to be a much safer way mm -hmm. of, of moving uh, heavy oil. There's certainly evidence to support that. Uh, we're going to fire through some issues now as well. And here's one uh, everybody's favorite or least favorite. It's ICBC. Andrew McLeod, my press gallery colleague from the TAI. Attorney General David Eby has said that ICBC was in a state comparable to a dumpster fire when the current government inherited it from the previous government. Now, neither of you were part of that previous government, but I'm wondering if you agree with Mr. Eby's assessment, and if you were in government now, what would you do to fix ICBC? Not sure there's an easy fix there, but Tracy Reddy's your finance critic. I know you're also responsible for hydro, but is there an easy fix to ICBC, or are rates inevitably going to go up big time? I don't think there's a, a uh, one, uh, one fix to ICBC. I think there's a number of things that have to be done. But um, I guess I, you know, I, I perhaps have a difference of opinion in terms of uh, how the go current government is uh, positioning uh, ICBC and uh, uh, it's quite interesting to me that uh, four or five months ago uh, we were talking about a hundred and ninety million dollar um, uh, you loss, know, deficit yeah. loss uh, and then four months later it's 1.3 billion. Um, to me that's quite interesting. Well, Peter Miller, I mean, that people have raised suspicions about this. Is, this. is this new number sort of artificially loaded up to make the situation look worse than it actually is? Yeah, and, and I, again, I think that's where you, you start to have a bit of problem um, when you start reviewing the, the budget documents and, and how ICBC ties into that in terms of uh, the credibility of their numbers and, and, and um, you know, how are they going to make exemptions when they have these other big issues. And, and as Tracy said, I mean, we had a, a document, an accounting of ICBC signed off by the, this current finance minister that stated much lower uh, problems and deficit problems than what was announced three months later. Um, and so, you know, there's certainly some of that would be the roll forward. You don't know when a claim is going to come forward, but to, to think that it's almost a billion dollars uh, suddenly appeared in the space of four months because of a change of government, um, you know, is a little bit of a, a hard pill to swallow. So I, I think um, trying to get to where the, the real uh, meat of the problem is, is going to be difficult. I, I do think it's been hyper politicized. Um, why? I'm not sure. They're the government now. I mean, whether they like it or not, they asked to be the ones in charge of fixing problems so here's a problem go ahead and fix it um, you know and so that's you know the, and I think they're still trying to figure out how to transition to that role as well although I think they'd much rather prefer to be in a position of trying to fix a problem <laughs> than complain about a problem after 16 years in opposition we're going to switch gears again now to transit with another question from uh, uh, Richard Zussman from Global who I'm giving a lot of airtime to tonight so here's Richard <laughs> Tracy, the NDP finally figured out a way to get the municipalities to pay for their 20% of Phase 2 transit projects. That obviously includes the Surrey LRT and the Broadway subway line extension. Do you think it was a fair deal and that municipalities are uh, covering the 20% the way they should be? So, Richard, talking about the latest uh, move by the municipalities, finding a way to cover their uh, shrinking portion of some very expensive projects. Have they done the right thing? Well, I mean, we need to get rapid transit uh, going in uh, the Lower Mainland. I mean, that's, that's certainly been one of my frustrations as a, as a British Columbian uh, who's commuted uh, for a long time in the Lower Mainland, uh, the lack of rapid transit infrastructure. And I think, uh, you know, any solution that gets us to move forward is a good thing. Um, having said that, uh, I do think that, again, the, the various increases in, in, uh, in fares and taxes 
that the municipalities are looking at uh, when you add it to everything else. Uh, I think there's going to be, again, this cry of uh, how is government at all levels uh, making life more affordable for British Columbians. So we're going to have a new Patella Bridge, Broadway subway line, Surrey LRT. My estimate, provincial government share, that's probably around 5 to $7 billion. Don't how's forget it? they took over the Golden Ears. And the Golden Ears. Uh, yeah. How's that going to play in Kamloops? Well, it's not playing well at all. Um, you know, so the, the deal with transit back in the day was that 100% uh, hospitals in the Lower Mainland would be paid for uh, by the province and, and the Lower Mainland would take care of their transit. And that's why BC Transit was set up and TransLink was set up. So BC Transit was the rest of the province and those BC Transit communities like Camels and Kelowna pay 40% of the capital uh, of hospitals. And so in Camels' case, we're, we're looking at a $500 million expansion. We're, we're coming up with $200 million. Uh, I was the hospital board chair that had to double people's hospital taxes, uh, go from $60 on an average house to $120, $130 uh, a year uh, to pay for that expansion, uh, as well as upgoing uh, capital of equipment and that on a yearly basis. And so, and we pay for transit uh, within our cities as well. We get a, a cut from the province and then we pay the, the 57%. So, um, you know, it's not a case of, of, of you know, woe is us. It's a case of, is it time to relook at these funding models then? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in Camels, I, I, you know, I asked the, the uh, transportation minister, well, we just redid our bridge for $8 million that the city owns. Or is there a plan to take over municipal bridges across the province? Or are we just picking up two or three municipal bridges in the lower mainland? And I think that's what people want to see. If there's a province-wide move to take over all the bridges that are mm -hmm. under municipal control, you can start to understand that. But if you start to pick off one bridge over another, we have bridges in the peace country that need to be replaced uh, that, that aren't. And well, so... Yeah, and, and, and of course the, the biggest bottleneck in the uh, in the province is the George Massey Tunnel. Yes. And that's been... That's not even on the drawing board. Not even yeah. on the drawing board. There's no money. And no. that's a real problem. But it's a provincial resource. Yeah. It's a real no, problem that, for our area. Transit. We could have a whole show probably <laughs> on transit projects. Yeah. I think, on yeah. I think so. We're going to try to get to at least a couple more clips here, including one. There's a fiscal freight train coming down the track of the BC government. And and that's about uh, uh, contracts, uh, 300,000 uh, employees' contracts are up next spring. Huge implications, and Bill Tillman on that. Ms. Reddy's public sector unions in British Columbia are approaching bargaining for a new contract and looking for increases around the cost of living 2% or more. What would your position be on bargaining? What kind of a pattern would you suggest the NDP follow? This is going to be, I talked to a couple of cabinet ministers who say this is going to dwarf anything the NDP is facing in terms of a financial crisis because 1% hike for across the board is $300 million, 2% is $600 million, and it gets embedded in the system. So you start counting that money every year. And union leaders, have, a number of them have talked about potentially a long contract with double-digit increases. So Tracy, you ready? Can BC government, whether it's NDP or Liberal, afford a generous contract with uh, 300,000 employees? Uh, I, I think it has to be, uh, they has to be mer managed very prudently. I mean, clearly, uh, with the size of the public sector, if you start getting double-digit um, uh, increases, it's going to, well, I, I think it would put the government into a deficit situation. They do have some... Uh, room. Uh, I think there's about $1.3 billion in, in each of the next two mm -hmm. years. Uh, but that could get eaten up very quickly and uh, they also have to have uh, money in the budget to uh, manage uh, unforeseen risks, uh, interest rate increases, uh, wildfires, etc. So uh, I think my advice to the government is to manage that very carefully because if they don't, um, it'll put them into a, a real problem. I think we're facing inevitable job action with a number of these public sector employees. Well, that, that's probably the great irony out of this. The job <laughs> action will come to an NDP government again, and, and that's happened in the 90s, right? They they mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of job action against them. And the day Barrett government in the 70s. Yeah, and, and I think it's because of that expectation of, of their unions that have supported them through the years saying, okay, it's now it's time. I, I, I don't begrudge the union for negotiating and, and throwing out a number to start and saying, you better come in. They did it for the BC Liberals all the time. Um, but I think there was also a recognition that that was going to get whittled down and, and somewhere in the middle was going to be an agreement. I, I don't get the sense that's what they're expecting this time. I, I think they're expecting uh, that that's going to be met or if not exceeded. Um, and so, again, that's why you don't just jump out with, with uh, 
budgetary uh, goodies uh, a year before you know you have to go negotiate with all of the public service. You know there's that expectation or they should have known there's that expectation. Um, and so for them to come up with that is going to be difficult. And I would point out that that $600 million increase, uh, Keith, is really, at, what is it, $612 million because let's not forget the employer health tax <laughs> are going to have to pay on top of that. So, um, you know, it's it, it starts to add up. Can we realistically go back to a zero and zero or a zero and one in, in terms of uh, people who haven't had a significant wage increase for some time? Well, I mean, I think uh, I think there is obviously an expectation that there has to be some reasonable um, increase. But uh, I think Peter's absolutely right. The problem with the NDP is that they create uh, these expectations, whether it's in the public in terms of uh, $10 a day de uh, child care or delivering 114,000 social housing units, to now unions thinking that the public sector unions thinking that they're going to get uh, a, a major increase. Think, and think we'll see strikes? Well, um, uh, you know, it's, we've certainly seen them in the past with the NDP government, and uh, there just is a mismatch between the expectations they create and what they can actually deliver. All right, well, my thanks to both of you, Tracy Reddys, Liberal Finance Critic, and Surrey White Rock MLA, Peter Milbar, Campus okay. North Thompson, Environment and Climate Change uh, Critic. Welcome to Voice of BC, and we hope you tune in again to Voice of BC, bringing the BC legislature into your living room. I'm Keith Baldry. I'll be back next week. Good night.